Ooh boy, it's almost lantern right. Ah, uh, another Chinese New Year, another batch of rewards for players to lose their gacha-addled minds over, a tale as old as time. Listen, let's talk for a minute. Come, have a seat. <clears throat> what the hell do you think you're doing? No, not miHoYo. I'm talking to you, Genshin community. You're mad. Again. About the same thing. Again. The only thing that's different this time around is that your wife's boyfriend is involved. And she's treating him slightly better than you. But you still don't get it. Genshin has a lot of problems. And I promise you, you're not going to solve them with more free pulls. Let me hit you with a reality check real quick. Are you familiar with Bartle's taxonomy of players? Basically, it sorts all kinds of players into four major archetypes. I'm here, by the way. And Genshin is critically failing every classification on this chart. Well, maybe not this one, because there's no PvP in this game. And it better frickin' stay that way. But let's focus on achievers for now. They're the type that like to overcome challenges. If you're a person that tries to 9-star floor 12 of Spiral Abyss every two weeks, this is you. And you have it the worst out of anyone. Genshin Impact, for the most part, is a very casual game. You can beat this game with pretty much any character you want. Take it from me, I'm the world's last Yoimiya main. But Spiral Abyss makes unreasonable demands. This is the closest thing Genshin has to an endgame, and it's the least fun, least rewarding part about the game. Let's review what you need to be successful in this game mode. You need eight characters split into two parties with level talents, refined weapons, and good artifacts. We'll come back to this. So if there was anything you would need to roll for to get a strong character or powerful constellation or just top up your resin to farm other stuff, this is it. But, and I'm gonna be really upfront here, why? Why would you spend your money to clear such a demanding, repetitive game mode where the only meaningful reward for doing so is the currency you get by spending money? Surgically allocated, by the way, so that each floor gives you just not enough primo gems for a pull. I don't do Spiral Abyss. I mean, I do sometimes, but I quit pretty much the instant I stop having fun. Yes, that means I miss out on five and a half wishes per month, but it also means I dodge the self-flagellation of letting Mihoyo throw three bosses at me at once with 2.5 times their max HP and the stressful time limit. I also don't have to deal with the artifacts. Holy hell, the artifacts. This is the real grind right here. If you want to outfit your character with the artifacts they need to do their job well, you will spend your life tediously re-clearing trivial domains. And then every clear, you get to play the slot machine of getting the artifact from the set you want. Spin the roulette wheel hoping it's the right slot. Roll the dice to see if it has the right primary stat. Flip a coin to see that it's five stars instead of four. Plus another coin to see that it has four affixes instead of three. And then pray to freaking god that the affixes are the right ones. All that, only to have the enhancement upgrades power up defense five times. Watch this, Lise. You can actually pinpoint the second when his heart rips in half. And... now! Why would I put myself through this? Look, this is my Yoemia. These are the artifacts that I got for her. They're terrible. I spent six hours getting these, and these were the best ones. Well, this one's not bad. That's because, in case you weren't counting, that was seven layers of RNG to go through, and you need to clear at least five of them in order to get barely viable equipment. This was as far as I got before I just said screw it. And you know what? It's more than enough to clear everything with the sole exception of Spiral Abyss. It's just not worth the effort, and I just don't see how after three years, anyone still playing the game could possibly think that it is. So let's talk about Explorers next. Hey, that's me. We have it the best, but we also have a complicated relationship with the game. Each patch, we get a stack of content to explore. New areas, quests, puzzles, whatever. But outside of the treasure compass and any gimmick-specific items we need to solve said puzzles, all the tools we use come from outside the game. Let's take a look at an example. All right, so right here we can see that I'm running short on Spectre Drops to upgrade my Raiden's Polearm. Now what the game intends for me to do with this moment is to open my adventure guide, navigate to Spectres, and from there I can just track the spawns on the map and take them out to collect the drops that I need. Except that, whoops, according to the adventure guide, I've already exterminated all the specters in my world. But if I hop over to a browser tab, I can open up an interactive map. Say, for example, the one on the Hoyo Lab website, search for specters, and oh look, I'm actually not even halfway done. Why do these give me different results? Why would you have two different tools that do effectively the same thing? And have the one that isn't part of the game be more accurate? <sighs> You know what else the interactive map tracks? Chests. This is my map. I like exploring a lot. Reminder that I'm here on the chart. So it shouldn't surprise you that I've 100%ed most of it. At least right up until the fourth installment of Desert. 
I don't like Desert's been putting that off, but I've kept up with most of Fontaine so far. Anyway, I found a stray chest in Leeway the other day, despite the fact that my map claims I have 100% exploration in that area. Clearly rounding up, I suppose. But that creates a problem for me, a person who wants to have opened every chest. I now know that 100% doesn't mean 100%, and I have no means of telling where or how the game is just straight up lying to me. The interactive map can track chests, but to do so accurately I'd have to mark off every chest that I've opened, and that's both tedious and unfun. Although, during the event last summer, the one that took place in the bottle, upon getting a high enough completion in that event area, you could unlock iterations of an item that they called the Joy Spot. When used, it would highlight chests and collectibles of note in a certain area, or at a high enough completion level, the rest of the collectibles in the zone. And wouldn't you know it, we have an NPC that directly tracks and rewards our exploration completion percent in each region. So tell me, why at 100% completion, do I not get a region-specific Joyce Spark equivalent that highlights missed chests and collectibles? I've already proven I can scour the land with the best of them. Why can't you reward me with the item I'd need to go pick up any wayward scraps? And, you know, let me have a little victory lap. I could do it with the interactive map if I wanted to, just go to where every chest should be, but why should I do that when I know that I could just be given a tool to do it for me? On a related note, the summer before that was the official-themed island adventure. One of the best events and storylines in the game, if you ask me. Bunch of really great quests there. Unfortunately, this is on an if-you-know-you-know -know basis, because like the other summer event with the Joy Spark, everything related to these events has since been removed from the game. I understand that it's a phone game, and that storage constraints are an issue, and compromises must be made for the sake of the Apple cucks with unexpandable memory. Way to bring down the curve, again as usual. But because I played that event and happened to enjoy it very much, I want to recommend others go play it too, but I can't. Which has more implications than just denying content to people who started playing the game later. Take for example, the fan favorite character from the event, the rising star known as Ask Me For Directions Arnold. And I hear you asking, what the heck does Arnold, a throwaway side character, have to do with anything? First of all, it's Ask Me For Directions Arnold. And secondly, how dare you? And third, little known fact, the voice behind Ask Me For Directions Arnold is on the come up. Seriously, this guy is the one succeeding Charles Martinet as the voice of Mario. And because the event he voiced a character in was removed from the game, we can no longer witness this person's first official video game voice role firsthand in game. And I think it's genuinely tragic that people can no longer see this person's big step up on their stairway to stardom. Speaking of stairs, it's time to talk about the socially types, specifically their teapots, and some crucial tools that they do not have. See, like a jillion years ago, when the teapot was first added to the game, they made available a handful of these landmass rock platform structures, and when you first see them, you think, oh cool, I can use these to add some sweet verticality to my teapot designs. Haha, <laughs> if only that were the case. Because even though these are here at different levels of elevation, we have no ramps and no stairs to properly utilize them. They barely even have any items you can use to bridge across gaps. In fairness, there are bounce pads, but look at how high these things launch you. You either have to wait out the entire overbounce or pop your glider on the way up to negate the upward momentum. Just don't let physics see you do that. It's so obvious that stairs and ramps would be quicker, easier, more aesthetically pleasing means of traversal. Not to mention the immersion-shattering implications. Like, who lives in this house? Do they have to climb or bounce every time they want to go home? What if they want to move in some furniture? How do they carry their groceries in without launching them out of the bag? What happens if their fragile boned grandpa tries to visit? And like, I see that stairs exist, sort of. Look, here's some, stapled to this stupid hilly churl hut. You're telling me it's too hard to just snip these off and give them to us as a separate asset? With all the landforms and buildings, it really tempts me to try and put something together out of them. But when I envision what the imaginary townsfolk would have to do to get around if I tried to add any verticality, it's like a big, bouncy knife straight into my creativity. At least they have a lot of cool minigames you can play in your teapot. There's Race to the Finish, Balloon Popping, Dummy Busting, Penguin Finding, Barrel Blasting, even a bunch of color-coded lantern hangers to keep score. That's a cool idea. But these are only useful for playing with friends you already have. So how does one player socialize with people they don't know? Well, you can matchmake to clear a domain where the matchmaking process will take longer than the domain itself pass. You could search through the co-op menu for someone who looks cool and add them. Maybe try to elbow your way into their world. But beyond that, you're basically 
limited to online forums or Discord servers. Gross. See, there used to be mini games you could queue into and meet and play with other players. There was that co-op Cryo Fellflower, the Fall Guy style courses, Prop Hunt. The last one was kind of like Hungry Hungry Hippos. I like that one. But these were all part of events. Events that have since ended and thus been removed. So those minigames are just gone, and there's no public space in-game to just hang out in with other players. If you want to play with others, you kind of just gotta roll the dice with randos. Which is kind of risky when bugs exist that let Cave players permanently delete critical structures in your world. Eh, look. I really like this game, and there are a lot of reasons to like it. The exploration is crazy fun, trust me, I know a little something about that. Stories are often just as good, Samaru and Fontaine Archon quests stand out to me, Tainari's character quest. The second part of Yoimiya's is phenomenal, but I can say that because I'm careful to avoid the parts of the game that I don't like. I don't force myself to play game modes that aren't worth the rewards, I don't invest time and effort into a system that feels more like a casino than an upgrade path, and I sure as hell don't pay any money to play the actual slot machine that is the gacha. Fully free to play, baby. Although if you really want to get into it, I actually won a Blessing of the Welkin Moon from one of the event raffles a while back. So as far as MiHoYo is concerned, they have profited like negative five bucks because of me. If that doesn't make me a true gacha gamer giga chad, I don't know what would. Which is why, if you're still playing this game, if you're mad about how you're being treated as a player, especially if you're spending your money, my advice to you would be to start trying to play the game a little bit more like me. Play the game in a way that lets you enjoy it. Don't play the parts you don't find fun. And don't give the game your money if you don't feel good about doing it. And I want you to really think about that last one, because I'm only just scratching the surface here. Everything I've mentioned are just the things that I care about. The things that I want fixed, changed, or added. But the actual iceberg of problems runs far deeper than I have the time or platform to complain about. There are a lot of things that this game needs to genuinely feel good to play again. And I promise you, no matter how thirsty you are, how compelled you are to clear Spiral Abyss for the 300th time, or how strongly MiHoYo's brainwashing and psychological conditioning tells you otherwise, that extra pulls, character selectors, and bouncy mommies are at the bottom of that list. The reality here is that MiHoYo and Genshin Impact are unlikely to change. I mean, why would they? People give them a gazillion dollars to play their games. The good news is, the thing that can change here is you. If you don't want to eat shit, Stop eating the shit.